Off the ball, breakfast. Ireland's Sports Breakfast Show. Okay, so we are beginning our build-up to Katie Taylor's upcoming fight. Her rematch against Chantelle Cameron in Dublin is just over a week away at this stage. And I'm delighted today to welcome, I guess, one of Katie Taylor's heroes to the show. She's one of the true greats of boxing with a record of 49 wins, 7 losses and 3 draws and an induction into the International Boxing Hall of Fame amongst a number of other Hall of Fames as well. She's a woman with an incredible story. Christy Salters Martin, a very good morning to you. How are you keeping? I'm well. Good morning. Thanks for having me on with you guys. Great to have you on. And just doing a little bit of reading, reminding myself about your career over the last 24 hours or so, it is remarkable how much of the phrases that were used about you and your your importance to boxing are now being used about Katie Taylor and have been used throughout her career. Things such as, you know, putting women's boxing on the map, the the, the phrase of being a, a trailblazer. Uh, do you notice that yourself? Do you see a little bit of the narrative around your own career when you analyse what's being said and written about Katie Taylor? A- absolutely. I'm going to tell you a, a good story. Um, I was actually in Madison Square Garden when Katie Taylor fought Amanda Serrano, sold out, place was crazy, and, and so many... Katie Taylor fans in the house was was really impressive. So after the fight, which absolutely lived up to all the hype and maybe even surpassed the hype in the billing, I called my friend Deirdre Gogarty and I said, Gogarty, we have now been moved to fight number two in the importance <laughs> of women's boxing history. And, and the truth is, I mean, I, I think we'll always be number one because of our fight that really broke down so many barriers. We made it possible to see Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano, but that fight as a fight, as the interest, as the fans, it surpassed it surpassed anything even that I could imagine would happen. When people were telling me the garden sold out, I'm like, yeah, sure, it sold out. But I was there. I was in the house, and I saw it myself and felt the electricity and the energy. It was unbelievable. That's the key comparison as well, is that that night in the garden was a great opportunity for Katie Taylor. And whether she would have wanted to have taken it in this way or not, I'm not sure, but she took the opportunity in the most dramatic way possible. She has a habit of when she wins fights, she wins them after a hell of a brawl. Obviously, uh, it was the same when her, her first defeat got chalked up a few months back. But she doesn't make things easy for herself, necessarily speaking, which just makes for great spectacles. And I think maybe the same goes for yourself in... 1996 on that famous night against Deirdre Gogarty. <laughs> it wasn't an easy win for you on, on that night either. No fight I ever fought was easy. <laughs> I, I Even the ones that should be easy, yes, I think Katie Taylor and I are alike in that. We want to fight. We want to we wanna get out there and brawl and, and um, test ourselves, but also put on a great show for the fans. And, and that, you know, it just... Uh, I miss it. I miss it. I miss being in the ring and competing. And um, it's so exciting to see where women's boxing is going today and the opportunities that they're getting. I just wish I would have been 20 years younger so I could be (laughs) in this mix of getting these great paydays and this awesome exposure. But at the same time, I do feel like my career with Don King really helped to open up so many doors for, for the women that are boxing today. Do you get that sense of appreciation when you meet Katie Taylor on that night? Because I know yourself and Deirdre were brought backstage at the Garden on that occasion. Did, did you really feel the, the sense of importance of what the two of you did in the 90s as trailblazers, to use that phrase again, in the sport? I, I was, Katie Taylor was an awesome person and it was so, I was so honoured to meet her. her. Her team was phenomenal. And, you know, we, a little story, I actually stood away from her dressing room because so much of the media was in there to see her and and it was her night i wanted i wanted to say hello congratulations and it's a pleasure to meet you but i don't want to be in in your spotlight i want you to go out there and and soak it all in and that's what i i i'm sure i reminded her take a deep breath enjoy every moment of this because i didn't have somebody there beside me telling me take a deep breath slow down, smell the roses, mm. and and really take in what's happening here because it is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Um, and and sometimes we let those opportunities pass. We don't we don't really take it in and 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 reflect and re- absorb what we have just accomplished. Does she strike you as a fighter who 
may hang up the gloves in the near future? Or what's your read on that? Um, you know, I think she's done so much for women's boxing for her own career. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if maybe she comes, even after this fight, you know, get the win. Um, maybe she does another fight with Amanda Serrano. Maybe not. I, I think she's she could just redeem herself here, call it a career, and move on to the next part. I'm sure she can, she'll be commentating uh, for, for Eddie Hearn or... Um, she, uh, you know, who knows? The sky's the limit. Mm. She's a she's a superhero. If anybody, you talk to anybody, especially from Ireland, and you say Katie Taylor, you don't even have to say Taylor. You just say Katie, and everybody yeah. knows her. So she, I, I'm sure she can do anything she would like. I think you're dead right. I think there's a, a great opportunity for her in coaching if that's what she wants to do as well. Um, I did want to ask you about your relationship with Deirdre Gogarty. Uh, I get the sense from the way you spoke about her there that you guys even if you don't talk all the time, you guys are pretty close and, and you're like old friends when you do meet up. Uh, absolutely. Um, Deirdre is a great person. She's um, a super warrior. I had no idea. I When I met her, I thought she's just this like really nice lady from Ireland, but she's got a mean streak. I mean, she <laughs> has a serious mean streak. And um, yeah, so we we touch base a few times a year. And then um, any time we can get together, we're absolutely, we absolutely take advantage of that opportunity as well. She's uh, definitely the, the shy and retiring type. And it seems kind of crazy that she would be such a, a fearsome boxer, given the, the public persona that she would have always had. But I guess you more than literally anybody else on the planet can attest to that. Absolutely. She's a warrior. No doubt. No doubt. That night in 1996, it was, for people who aren't overly familiar with this fight, it was the undercard of Mike Tyson versus Frank Bruno, their second fight uh, in Las Vegas. It was given the award of fight of the night on that occasion. Your bloodied nose, I think, uh, Christy, is probably the... <laughs> we say You can say hello to your dog uh, this morning as well. The champ. <laughs> What's his name? Champ. Champ. Champ, like champ, champion. Champ. <laughs> yeah. As we say hello to champ, I was just mentioning... Uh, one of the more iconic moments from that night in, in 1996 was was that bloodied nose. I think, did, have you referred to it as the most important bloodied nose of, of your career? And that, that image alone sort of helped you get to a whole new level. I think it was the most profitable bloody nose <laughs> in boxing history. Not just my career, but in boxing history. And it, without the blood, I, I don't know how many people would have taken notice, but I think so many people saw me bleeding like crazy. Um, and they thought she's going to quit or, or, you know, what's going to happen next. But I fought through and Gorgody kept piling on punches. Um, and it was, you know, it was just an exciting fight from, from the word go. And we just showed that night that women can fight as well. And we're warriors. I mean, we're going to fight sometimes I think harder than some of the guys because we have so much at stake and we know we only have one shot. So many guys think, oh, well, even if I mess up today or I can't make it, I can't get this win, uh, I'm not going to fight as hard as I should. My toenail hurts. I'm going to get another opportunity. Women are not going to get that second opportunity. It's interesting when you spoke about the parallels between yourself and Taylor and I guess two people who are leading and at the forefront of uh, women in boxing. It, does it? It's kind of surprising to me maybe in hindsight that you know, the sport itself didn't explode for everybody in the aftermath of that fight between yourself and Deirdre Gogarty. I mean, your, your career obviously went on to the next level. You had Don King promoting you. It, it, it does seem a bit strange that maybe Don King didn't, you know, expand his stable of female fighters too much after that, or that that wasn't a, a hugely significant moment for the sport as a whole. It kind of felt that we had to wait 15 years or so for, for the the sport on the female side to, to take it to the next level. What, was, was that your experience? I, I agree with you, uh, but I, I think at that particular moment in the 90s, Don King had so many male champions. He was just, you know, Mike Tyson was back. There was so much going on with his stable of fighters that, that yeah, I was, I was there and I was making some noise, but it wasn't at the top of his priority list to help women's boxing. His thing was, I have Christy Martin. She's doing pretty good. She's okay. She's making some excitement on my shows. Let's just keep finding opponents for her. Um, and and there was never that other person, I mean, other than Lucia Riker, which there were conversations between Riker and Don King to make the fight. There was not that other person 
we could build into a big fight um, other than than Riker, and she wasn't willing to to make a deal with Don King, so that fight never happened. Um, yeah, it's too bad. And then I thought Layla Ali, you know, kind of like passing the torch. Layla beat me. She'll take it to the next level. But Layla had too many uh, other things outside of boxing, too many opportunities. She didn't need to stay in boxing to to um, to gain fame, to gain money. She would. There was, you know. She does TV shows. She does commentary. She makes appearances because she's Layla Ali. Um, so wh why take punches? You know, I, I don't think I think Layla loved boxing, but I don't think she had the love for it like like I had. Yeah, I loved my job. <laughs> it definitely seemed that way. Um, Sports Illustrated cover stars in 1996, uh, to name but a few: Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, Tiger Woods, Christy Martin, uh, the one and only female boxer to appear on the cover of Sports Illustrated. As far as I know, that's a fact that is still true to this day. I guess if you're judging anybody's trajectory in the mid-90s, being on the cover of SI is a pretty good way to do it. So that was a real sense that, that you had made it, I guess, at that point, that the, the cover story was published a couple of months after that incredible fight against Deirdre Gogarty. I'm not sure when was the last time you've actually uh, read this piece, Chris, or if you've got any thoughts on the actual article that accompanied uh, the, the, the cover because I think to be kind to it, I think it's probably a profile that's very much of its time. I don't think you would see an article like this being written about Katie Taylor today. It was, I, I don't want to say disrespectful to you, but it, it definitely wasn't, uh, it wouldn't feel in place in 2023, let's put it that way. Um, well, I haven't, read the, I haven't read the story for a very long time, but right. since you've mentioned it, I will, I will pull it out and, and read it <laughs> at some point today. Um, I, I, it's a great honor to be on the cover of Sports mm. Illustrated in the '90s. That's you know people were still buying magazines. You went to the magazine store and and actually purchased it. You had had it in hand. You didn't just read it on the internet. Um, so it was a great honor to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. To me, at that time, like Sports Illustrated was was the uh, ultimate goal. That's the mm. ultimate achievement if you get on the cover of Sports Illustrated for a sports person. Um, so. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And and to be the only female boxer even up to today to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated is is um is pretty cool to to be able to to say that that I was able to do that. 100%. Um just a, a, a couple of bits from that piece which I, I just think are, are quite interesting and I'd be keen to get your thoughts on them is uh, it, towards the end of the piece that the, the journalist says that it may be that women's boxing for all its growing popularity among the athletes won't grow beyond the sideshow status that it has sporadically enjoyed. And he says, as more and more people resist the idea of boxing in general, women's boxing certainly becomes an increasingly pointless frontier. And that's kind of the point I'm making, that it would be very, he probably, probably couldn't say, he probably wouldn't hear that said because it would be very inaccurate about uh, women in boxing at the moment. But also it's a company with, with a photo of, of you hoovering in the home. And there was definitely this idea of trying to paint a picture of uh, a good housewife as much as a good boxer, I felt, reading it back. Uh, was that something at all that, that struck you at the time or or was that very much of its time that that was just the way female athletes were reported on and written about in 1996? I think it was probably an article of its time. I You know, that so many people wanted to see that women athletes were um, women, that, you mm. know, you were still at home cooking and, and you know, these you still had your place. You're still, uh, you know, the woman of the house. Um, so I, I think it was definitely of its time. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. Did, did you feel comfortable with the idea of being referred to as a trailblazer and somebody who might be able to, to shatter the glass ceiling, as it were, at that point? I always told everybody that I wasn't the, I, I wasn't the pioneer. I'm not the, I mean, I might be a trailblazer because I think a trailblazer can come at any point in history. But um, definitely there were so many women before me uh, Barbara Buttrick fought way a long time ago and uh, over in England. Um, there were there was so many women, Cat Davis, uh, uh, Lady Tiger. There's a lot of ladies that tried to get licensed in New York and and finally were able to accomplish that. So everybody kind of cracked open the door just a little bit, a little bit, a little. And then then I feel like with Don King's help, I was able to like kind of bust through the door, bust through that glass ceiling, and um, and really open up opportunities for more women that came after me and about that same time women started to be able to box in the olympics uh or no, no 
in the amateurs. Mm. And once women became accepted in the amateurs, I really, really thought that would put a big help on professional women's boxing. I'm not sure that I've seen the the growth in professional women's boxing that I thought we would, but we definitely are moving in that direction. And, and we'll see. We just need that personality um, that's going to just re-energize women's boxing. And I think boxing fans want to see people get knocked out. Boxing fans want to see people bleed. Boxing fans want to see fights. And as long as women are able to do that, then they're going to be accepted. And it's a different time. It's a different time now. Young boys are used to playing sports right beside the girls. You know, in the in as you're young, six, seven, eight years old, boys and girls are playing soccer together. They're playing all different sports together. So they're used to girls being athletes as well. Yeah, it's a very good point. Um, how, how much in general, Christy, did, did you feel that you had to hide your true self from the public in and around this time when your profile was, was at its highest? I think... Um, I was just in a bad situation. If you're talking about, uh, I think you're talking about sexuality and that's just, I was just in a tough situation. I was married to um, a narcissist, um, uh, an abuser and someone that was just, he just controlled every moment of my life. And, and I do believe that I got opportunities because people saw me married to Jim and as a heterosexual woman, where if I would have just gone into Don King's office with a girlfriend, I'm not sure we've been given the same opportunity at that time in the nineties that I was given, you know, because I was married to a man. It, it was uh, a situation where you think that not only Don King, but the whole boxing world would have judged you negatively because of that. I, I, absolutely. I think, you know, now times are changed a little bit from 1993 is when I signed with Don King. So it's, you know, 30 years ago. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely changed the way people are less concerned about other people's sexuality and um, what they're doing in their private life. So I, I think a gay, gay female athlete today could get breaks and get opportunities and get promoted, whereas in the 90s, it would be tough. It was tough. I guess when I asked the question about not being able to be your true self in public, it's it's not just to do with, with your sexuality. It's, I guess, to do with everything in your life and... I mean, by, by all means, feel free to, to talk as little or as much about this as, as you're comfortable doing, Christy, but the influence of, of your husband at, in that time in your life must have been unbelievably overbearing in terms of being incapable to, to show your true self. I mean, whether it's trying to further yourself as a boxer, whether it's trying to, 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 to show your, yourself through uh, your sexuality, whatever it may be, it did feel that there was this straitjacket on you as an individual in almost every way. It was really, it was tough because I'm, I'm really quiet. And so I would go into different events that I would be invited to and he would be a jerk. I mean, he would just be a total asshole to people. And, and that comes back on me. It doesn't look, oh, people aren't walking away saying, um, you know, Jim Martin was an ass to deal with. They said Christy's husband. So it was, it was hard. And he controlled who I talked to, what I said, who talked to me. Uh, if I talked to someone too long, you know, it was he was upset about that, and then I had to I had to deal with it when I went home. So, it, it was it was tough. My my happiness and my comfort level was definitely in the ring. At what point did that relationship, for you, begin to feel dangerous and threatening to you? Before I even married him, he told me if I left ever left him, he would kill me. And I was 22 years old. I kind of laughed it off. I, I really didn't take it seriously, even though he would tell me this over and over. Um, but sometime during the marriage, I started to believe this might happen. By the end, I knew it was going to happen. The sequence of events in November 2010 are shocking. And as I say, Christy, by all means, feel free to not entertain this question whatsoever, but I am conscious that people who are listening to this will be coming to your story for the first time. Of course, if you're if you're comfortable sharing the details, the, the, the sequence of events in November 2010 is when I guess you probably acutely realised that the threats that had been there from very early in your relationship were going to become very real. Right. I, November 23rd, 2010, I had made the decision that I would leave and I I had been gone for a few days, actually, 
I came back and I knew that that he would try to kill me that day. I actually knew he would kill me that day. And um, that's what happened. He stabbed me repeatedly, um, shot me, cut me up, left me for dead, punctured my lung. He cut my calf muscle almost completely from my leg. Um, but God had a plan for me. You know, God, God does have a plan and that I, I believe in that plan is so I can help others. And that's really what I try to do now is I have Christie's Champs as a nonprofit for domestic violence awareness. And we speak at different places, whether it be a domestic violence shelter, um, schools, jails, I've been everywhere to, to speak and share my story and just to talk to people about domestic violence um, and that it can happen anywhere to anyone. And just the importance of trying to make a difference. We also use boxing and amateur boxing programs to to try to give kids that are in domestic violence homes um, a place to be. We put computers in, in gyms um, so that, that they'll have computer access for school projects. Um, I just want to make a difference. When it comes to that work that you're doing, I guess one of the most powerful things that a lot of survivors can experience is just the feeling of not being alone and having somebody of note who's gone through this. Because I, I just from reading your interviews, what watching the, the, the Netflix documentary, it did feel like an unbelievably isolating time amongst other way worse things as well for you in, in those 2000s in, into 2010, that you did feel completely like an island, I guess, at, at this point in terms of the coercion and, and, and abuse that was going on behind closed doors in your home. It was a tough situation because I had been married to Jim for almost 20 years. So after 20 years, your friends, the people in your life are are like both of your friends. So I felt like I didn't have anyone that I could reach out to. And and I was afraid if I, you know, there were some friends I like, I'm, I can talk to this person, but I know what they're going to do. They're going to say something to Jim. Well, then that's just going to come back on me and make it worse. So you are isolated. And, and Jim did a really great job through my boxing career to, for, to put me on an island and to convince me that I needed to stand on that island and just worry about my boxing career and not worry about women's boxing and promoting other female boxers. Just just promote yourself, which, I mean, I was my product. So I I did have to promote me and, and not worry so much about everybody else. But he convinced me that that's the way, only way I should see it. I should never take into consideration um, someone else's hard work and to try to help them out a little bit if I could. That, that's a really interesting point. And I, I do wonder as well if, if that's something that you realize more and more as, as time passes. Absolutely. I, I know as time goes on, I have realized that just how, how many opportunities I missed because he... He just wanted me to be on the island. He didn't want anybody. He wouldn't allow me to bring in a strength and conditioning guy. He wouldn't allow me to bring in another coach. He wouldn't, you know, he didn't want uh, uh, somebody to help me with my diet. He wanted to keep all the decision making left up to him. And and now I, I absolutely realize why, because he was afraid that somebody would tell me, Christy, do you not see what's happening? You know, they would say to me, do you not see what he's doing? And you need to get out of this situation. I had to finally come to that strength on my own and make that decision that I had to go, I had to get away or die. And I think strength is the, the operative word. That image that you painted for us a moment ago of him leaving you to die, it's not only the unbelievable emotional and mental strength to be able to save yourself in that moment, the physical strength, the ability to get yourself from that bedroom where he was leaving you to die to, to get onto the road where a passing motorist essentially saves your life. What, have you been able to, to verbalize and think about what actually pushed you to that moment to, to, to save your life? God, um, as I could hear my lung gurgling, I knew he was going to kill me. If I, you know, I knew he was going to kill me. He was going to do something else to me. Now, he's already shot me. He's already stabbed me. But there's no way he's going to let me live. There's there's absolutely no way I can live. So I I prayed really hard. You know, God, please show me some way to get out of here. And at that moment, I heard the shower water turn on. Jim had gotten into the shower to to clean the blood off of himself. Um, and that was God telling me, it's time, Christy, get up. 
and and get out of the house. And I had tried so many times before to to get up, and every time I would raise up, like blood would start squirting out of all these holes in my body. And I just this time, I, I got up, and and I'm pretty sure God carried me out um, because my calf muscle was like I said, com- cut almost completely from my leg, and and I was able to walk out, and and flag down Rick Cole, my angel. And he took me to the hospital and they put me back together. The, the fact that life for you carries on and you manage to go about your day-to-day business is beyond achievement enough, but it is also, I must say, absolutely remarkable that you managed to put together a couple of fights after this moment as well. Can you talk us through that that next step of your journey and, again, the, the, the mental and the physical in that challenge? Was it almost a sort of a bit of a screw you to him that you did get back into the ring after that? Was it was that part of the the incentive of, of continuing your fighting career after that horrific moment in 2010? Absolutely. I wanted so badly. And I had wanted I had, had a goal of winning 50 fights before the shooting. And um, but now afterwards it was more important that I win this 50th fight without Jim Martin. So I I um called Bob, well, first call was to Miguel Diaz and asked him would he be my trainer. He said, of course. I called Don King's office. Um, DK didn't talk to me at that time, so I I called, um, after I called Miguel, he told me, I'm going to talk to Bob, and I'll call you back in just an hour. So he did, and Aram said for me to fly out. When I got out of the hospital, fly out to um, to Vegas to see him, he would put me on the show. So that's what happened. I I was supposed to fight in um, March, just after being shot in, in November. And Miguel had put me into spar, a kid, a young male fighter. He broke my rib sparring, but it was the same rib that Jim had shot. So the rib was probably broken already. I just didn't know. And um, I was pushed to fighting in January. So now I'm fighting in January. I'm prepared. I'm, I'm fighting okay, winning every round. And I broke my hand. I had broken my hand like in the third round. Now we're in the last round of the fight. 50 seconds to go from my 50th win, and I throw a right hand and grimace. And when I grimace, the referee took me over to the doctor. The doctor stops the fight. I'm jumping up and down. Like, it's 50 seconds to go. How can you stop a fight for a broken hand? I just got shot and stabbed. It makes no sense. It's 50 seconds. And he said, he came back to my dressing room, and he said, Christy, I was at that ringside physician conference that you spoke at, and you said, we as ringside physicians have to protect fighters from themselves. And I went, I went left and I said, but I wasn't talking about me (laughs) and I didn't say it so kindly. And I I just couldn't believe I'm 50 seconds from my 50th win. Everybody knows what I've been through and you don't give me the opportunity to get this win. Um, So the fight was stopped. I lost and um, I go to surgery to have my hand fixed. I have a stroke, but I'm still thinking, I'm, I'm still thinking that I can still get a win, even though the doctor told me don't don't fight ever again. Uh, you don't don't get hit in the head. I didn't tell anyone except the people very close to me that I had had a stroke and I fought Mia St. John. I lost to Mia, and when I lost to Mia, I knew, oh my God, your career is over, and you kind of you really screwed up because you should have never taken a fight after having a stroke. And and then to lose to Mia hurt my it hurt my soul because I. I I respect her as a person and as a business person, but as a fighter, I have zero respect for her. <laughs> I, I obviously I can't relate with the unbelievable mentality that you have. And obviously that's always been there through your life with the winning mentality that you had to have to, to put together the career that you have. However, after the last, what is it, 12 years since you've last been in the ring, does it sit a little bit easier with you, at least those two defeats? The fact that you were there i know I, I'm, I'm not saying that taking part is is winning for you because you are a winner but as, as time has passed by do you at least appreciate the unbelievable achievement it is to have got your career back on after what happened to you i think the first one with dakota stone it was a statement that hey you know no matter what i'm gonna get back in here and and everybody that saw the fight i mean i just had to finish the last 50 seconds on my feet and they know i won the i would have won so, so there was a little bit of, okay, I, I'll never accept the referee or the ju- the doctor stopping the fight, but it's almost like I know I won. And then with Mia, 
it was just stupid. It was just a stupid decision to to try to fight after the stroke, and I was terrible, and the fight was terrible. Um, that one I definitely wish I could have back. I just had um, one last question on this area of, of your life. I, I didn't quite realize until I uh, watched the the Untold series on Netflix and the episode that's featured on you that they actually went into prison and and interviewed Jim. How how did that feel to you watching that back when when he was going to be a part of the documentary? Were you like, good, everything should be on the record, or or how did that make you feel? Um. No, the whole craziest thing about it is I, I really thought that it would be his opportunity to show some remorse or sorrow or like I, I did this to her, mm-hmm. but it was just the opposite. So I, I guess I expected something or, or wished for something that I knew. I guess I had wished for that for 20 years and it never happened. So why did I think it was going to happen on the Netflix documentary? I, I don't know. But it was uh, eerie, I guess, seeing him. Um, yeah, he hasn't changed. He's still the same, you know, arrogant, narcissist jerk that he was. How are you day to day at the moment, Christy? It, it seems that, you know, when it comes to your professional pursuits, life is going pretty good. But it's, uh, on, a, on an emotional level and on a day to day level, how, how are things? You know, I'm pretty good most days. Um, it's crazy how your mind or your body reacts. It seems it's almost like I can feel it that it's coming up on the November 23rd, and and it just seems like it's a tough week every year. And even even we're 13 years away, it, it's still there, and it's it's just it's really a crazy, unexplainable feeling to tell someone that. This man tried to kill me. I mean, the truth is he thought he killed me. Um, there's not a whole lot of people that can share that uh, conversation with you that have also been in that path, been down that path. I can imagine. You mentioned as well, and it's not just Christy Martin promotions that you've got going on, Christy's Champs. That obviously is going to be an, an amazing part of your legacy and is an amazing part of, of your legacy. Um, I guess on a day-to-day basis, from from that perspective, from being involved with Christie's Champs and, and uh, leading that whole thing, do you see similar cases? Is is there still um, many situations where you see boxers who, on the surface of things, look like they're doing okay, and behind the scenes, there's still a lot of isolation going on. There's still a lot of emotional and often physical abuse going on in in the sport. Uh, absolutely, in in boxing, in life. Um, there's so many times, especially with social media, I mean, we really think this is the way people are living that, you know, people want to post everything that's positive, but so many times there's, there's much more negative, um, that's going on behind the, behind the scenes. And, and that's what actually last night, Lisa said something to me about, this is the way people see you. Christy, and it's it was all it was a positive song. Like I don't even remember what it was, and I'm like, yeah, but that's because people didn't see me behind the cameras. They didn't see me when the doors closed. They had no idea what I lived through for 20 years, and and they can see things are positive now, but they don't know the demons that still live in my head. And and I would love to kick them out. You know, someone once told me that you're letting those those demons live in your head rent free. And some of them I moved out, but some of them are still there. How how have you managed to move out those demons so far? You know, it's work. It's work. You have to um, you have to work at it, and just come to some kind of realization and some something that you can feel comfortable that. No, I, that's okay. Yes, it happened. Yes, that's the way that we handled it, but. Put it, put it in a box, and, and that box should never be opened again. It's not easy. The story with, um, you mentioned Lisa there a moment ago, that this is certainly one of the unquestionably uh, positive elements of uh, of the last few, few years of your life. I think it's a remarkable story. Not too many people uh, have settled down with a previous opponent in the ring, I dare say, Christy. I, I, th- does it help that she understands you more than a lot of other people do, even just coming from that 
boxing background as well because it does seem that she has been a, an amazing uh, emotional crutch for you. Lisa's a great, great person, and she, she definitely understands the boxing world um, to a degree. Sure. Um, but she's been so fortunate because in her life, from her parents, from, from the relationships that she had before, she, she's never been in this kind of domestic violence um, situation. So it's hard for her to relate. And until we really got together and I started taking her to the uh, Christie's Champs events, she had no idea. And, and just hearing my story, but hearing other people's story really impacted her and um, kind of opened up her eyes to what's what happening in so many people's lives out there. Um, in terms of those Christie's Champs events, just as a, as a final point, what, what sort of things have you got going on? What, what do the events look like? Right now we're doing a fundraiser, actually in my brother's name. My younger brother passed from cancer uh, three years ago. And so for Christmas, uh, we're doing a fundraiser for some kids back home in, in my little town in West Virginia. Um, we do, we've done motorcycle rides, uh, Showtime boxing, which is going away, once donated tickets uh, to a big fight and hotel rooms, uh, flights, whole, whole accommodations. So we did chances on that and just to raise money for Christie's Champs. And, and like I mentioned, we we take the money and donate it to computers. We put computers in, in local boxing gyms. So anything we can do, um, fundraisers, we're out there doing. We're, we're also doing a cell phone drive where people in different cities can donate their old, used cell phones. And we'll give those to domestic violence shelters so they can give them to some of the the women that come in, so you know they'll have that, whether it be hidden or, um, you know, maybe just, just so they have a way of contacting help. Amazing, and uh, it feels uh, you know a little bit trivial to t talk about boxing in, in the face of all of this, but you know it's it's an important distraction all the same. And I do wonder, have you got the next Christy Martin coming through in in your boxing promotions company? You know, I catch a lot of crap because I really don't have a female boxer. Right. Um, under my promotion, I, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, it's hard finding opponents. It's hard. Um, it's yeah, it's hard finding opponents and, and then finding, but I'm not against it. I just, if I would see that young female fighter that, that can help sell tickets and help my promotion, I'm just a small promotion. So, um, I can't really afford to, to spend the money to, to bring in female fighters. And then if somebody pulls out at the last minute, you know, where do you go for a replacement? It's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, um, it's a tough road, but I do try my best to show up to the female fights and, um, and give all the promotion and, um, all the help and all the support that I can. For sure. I think, uh, I think you've, I think Kelly Taylor has probably said it in the past that she's standing on your shoulders. And I think, uh, your career alone is, is enough to have promoted a sport. Um, Christy, it's, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you. Thank you so much for being so sharing and for taking the call and being so generous with your time. Really appreciate it. And good to see that, that life is going good for you at the moment. Uh, great to see Champ there as well, your dog on, uh, on Skype. He's my little buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And, and um, you know, good luck to Katie, yeah. for sure. I'm very proud of everything she's done. And, um, you know, I don't think it's my shoulder she's standing on. I think it's dear to Gogarty uh, because I'm sure Gogarty helped break down some walls so she can do what she's doing in Ireland right now. I think uh, you both had a, a bit of a role in that. Chrissy Salters-Martin, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day.